that. What's up, guys? Welcome to the Beyond the Course podcast. Today's guest is Natalie Lowe, owner of ProFit Conditioning, Golf Conditioning. Natalie, how are you? I'm good, Alex. Thanks for having me. Although, just said I'm a, a little bit sunburned because I've been stood outside on a golf course all day, sadly, with no sun cream. <laughs> yeah, well, it's not too bad, is it? Working out on a golf course, can't beat that. So, um, obviously, I know. you know, I've said off air that we've, we've already met. I'm a, a client at yours at your business. So, I really want to just start with your background in golf first before we get into the business. So, for everybody that doesn't know you, tell them a little bit about yourself, how you got into golf, and, and your journey kind of. To, to where you are now with your business? Yeah, um, so I started playing golf when I was about 15. Um, really sporty person. I played uh, football to quite a good standard and, and got a black belt in karate when I was younger. So I was sort of always into sport regardless and, and actually never into golf at all. And my brother wanted to start playing. Uh, he's four years younger than me. So I ended up going along with him. Actually secretly quite liked it. And um, just started playing slowly, started going to the driving range. We both joined the local club um, and actually found out, had some friends from school that were playing as well. So it became a bit of a Sunday thing. We started playing in the junior comps, got a handicap um, and, and loved it from there, really. I think at the minute I was on a golf course, I absolutely loved it. And um, just slowly, as I got better and better, started to think I'd quite like to do this professionally. Um, got my handicap down. I, was playing for the county playing in in UK amateur events and and I turned pro when I was 22 I think um went to Q school a couple of times played on the LET access tour um didn't really do so much on that didn't play well and and I kind of got to that point and I was like I just don't think I'm good enough at this standard um I, I could play some decent golf at the time but I just wasn't consistent enough and and one of the things now, ironically, I kind of look back and think I just didn't hit it far enough for it to be an advantage for me. There were people that were hitting it even, you know, years ago, 10, 20, 30, 40 yards past me, which, as we know now, is a massive advantage in the game. So um, that's kind of how I got into golf. And as I decided to stop playing competitively, I was thinking, right, I need a job now. I'm going to have to join the rat race and get in the real world. Um, and decided to become a PT, and that's sort of how I found myself into golf fitness now. Yeah, so we'll get onto the professional side in, in a little while, but in terms of what age you started then, you said around 15. Um, I mean, does that is that quite young, in your opinion? I mean, we, I speak to a little, um, a golfer the other day, for example, who's professional, and he started at 14, and normally when you speak to a lot of the professionals, it's normally more like six, five, you know, maybe seven or eight at max, so you know how, how many what percentage of people can turn pro when they're starting at that sort of age because it seems like a late age yeah it's quite late um I mean I was sort of just about 15 as well um I think it probably is quite late for nowadays like you see you pull 15 year olds off uh, you know random golf clubs there'd be some sort of plus one plus two handicappers um so for me you know I mean this is I'm 33 tomorrow ironically um so it's a long time ago, but I think if you look now, like people are almost getting their kids into sport younger and younger and younger because people are getting better younger and younger and younger. Mm -hmm. So they're thinking if you're not into, you know, serious things with sport, sometimes by like 10 and 11, then they rule you out of, you know, having any opportunity and any chance of making it as a pro at whatever sport you want to play. So I guess it in real terms, yeah, I was quite old really. Um, for me, I don't think that feels old. I think uh, 15 is obviously still really young and, and sure. maybe slightly towards a more mature end of the scale. If you're playing at, at an age like seven or eight, you've obviously got a bit of an awareness of, of certain things. But if you've been playing golf, you know, someone like Rory McIlroy that's started at two or three, mm -hmm. and obviously you've got all that extra time and an extra room to grow and um, develop your skills along the way. So I guess it probably is an advantage to a certain degree. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned a couple of reasons why you thought maybe why you didn't quite make it as far as you wanted to. Do you think that had any kind of effect on it as well? Or do you think it was, was nothing to do with it in terms of you maybe starting later than some of the people you were coming up against as a pro? Uh, potentially. I mean, there's, you know, I, there's, there's research to suggest that people born later in a school year are at a disadvantage, which for me, I'm, you know, my birthday's tomorrow, 27th of August. So I'm the youngest in my school year. Um you know, if we go seven days in advance, so 
someone else could be born next week, yet we're still in the same school year. So I would have sure. been competing against people who were a full 12 months older than me, 12 months more developed, they've grown, uh, they're stronger than I was, but yet we'd still be in the same category of competitions as it be. So I think there is some sort of research to suggest that across many sports that that could be a factor. Um, with golf at the time, I'm not not so much maybe and compared to sports like, so let's say something that's more physically, um, like more of a physical contact sport like football or rugby where you have to make direct contact with someone else or you have to be faster than someone else. Um, I think it probably plays a certain factor in terms of like club head speed and driving distance, which obviously if you can hit it further, you, you are at an advantage regardless. Yeah, I think it's that kind of age as well, where obviously you start to get more responsibilities. School's obviously a lot more important than, say, again, when you were maybe six or seven. Um, you know, some kids are even thinking about getting jobs and stuff at that age. So I imagine as well, you didn't have, you know, maybe as much time that you maybe needed to be practicing and going around the country, playing in tournaments and all that kind of thing. Again, compared to somebody that's six or seven, school's important still, but they definitely have a lot more free time to, to do stuff like that. Yeah, I think as well, you know, when you start younger, you get into sort of bigger competitions sooner. So like girls and boys events, things like um, English girls and British girls and British boys and things like that. And that gives you a level of competition experience. So you, you have a bit of a taste of that early doors. Whereas for me, I don't think I played like a national event till I was probably back end of 16, early 17. Um, I mean, I developed relatively quickly. I was I was off uh, four by the time I was almost 17. So I picked it up quite quick. Wow. Mm. Um, but then I'm going to, you know, bigger events, playing for the first time, being like pretty starstruck in the sense that the first time there was a leaderboard that I'd ever seen a leaderboard, you know, when you're pitching up on a Sunday at a junior comp, you don't have anything like that. And all of a sudden sure. it's very official and all the flags look the same and it's, you've got to register and all these other things that you're just not used to. Whereas people who've maybe had a taste of that earlier on when they're younger, kind of used to that process and it's sort of it's like anything isn't it you know you, the first time you do something it's all a bit strange and a bit new and and a bit um daunting in a way and then the more you do it the you know the more you get used to it um so I think there probably is a a, a bit of something in that for sure yeah yeah, I mean, it's a good point. I mean, that's why, for example, watching Louise Duncan play this weekend in that AIG Women's Open, so impressive. I mean, she's obviously a little yeah. bit used to kind of the, the, the competition and all that kind of thing, but that was a completely, you know, different step up for her, wasn't it? So really impressive to see. And um, I know like when we talked about, you know, your career in golf, the actual playing side of it, and when you mentioned it now, and I've heard you talk about it in your podcast, you do have that little bit of like, sort of negativity in your voice in terms of maybe you feel like you you know you're ashamed of it or you could have done more but I really think it isn't something to be unhappy about you know I think you should definitely be happy that that you managed to give it a go and got to that level to be able to give it a go so what sort of advice would you give to any amateur or uh, professional that is trying to make it as you were uh, what's what's the best kind of advice you could give to those those sort of people that's a million dollar question that yeah isn't it? <laughs> um <clears throat> it's a very good question um, I, I think it, it very much depends on what you want from it. I think expectation is key. If you can manage expectations, then you really are onto a winner. And that comes in in different formats, doesn't it? Because it's your expectations of yourself in terms of how you expect to hit the ball, what you expect to score, where you expect to place in this event, what you want from your career. And then you've got expectations of all the people around you. So what do my mum and dad think? What do my you know other playing partners think? Um, you know what it's like when you sort of you hit a bad shot on a golf course and you're thinking oh god everyone's thinking you know what's she doing or and you, you still have that in your head like every bad shot that you hit um so I think managing expectations is really important um and and it's it's such a weak answer in a way but I, I really do think you have to enjoy it it's it's a really hard life um and if you're not enjoying it along the way it, there's just no point um, I suppose they're kind of like the basics. If we're if we're looking at it from more of a skill set and technical aspect, then sure. you know you, you, your technique's got to be nails. There there are too many male and females who just swing it so good that if you can't compete against that, and this really does sound negative, but you, you're making it really hard for yourself. You know the gym obviously has to be a huge factor because statistically we know now that people that hit the ball the furthest make the most money. Um, so that's something that you're competing against. Um, but I, th I think if you believe in yourself, I think you should go for it, regardless of whatever it is in life. Like, I don't think you should be concerned about what other people think or, 
who you're comparing yourself against. I think if you if you have that desire and that belief and that energy to work hard, then you only live once. You know, what's the worst that's going to happen? It's you don't sure. make it. Well, you're not going to make it if you don't try. So you may as well just go for it. Throw all, throw everything in, whatever your all in is, throw it in mm -hmm. and just give it a go. Yeah, I mean, so you've obviously mentioned that you've now moved into your, your personal training stuff in the business that you've got. So at that age, when you were trying to make it, were you into the fitness side at all? Were you into, um, you know, getting yourself physically fit for golf at that time? Or did that not come until literally after the, the kind of pro career? Um, I was, but it was kind of misguided, I think. Um, I've always been into the gym. I'd always gone to the gym since I was old enough to go. Um, so I, I think I started to try and do things that, you know, kind of like anyone, when you don't know what you're doing, you, you look around to see what other people are doing or, you know, there was no YouTube at that point in time. So it wasn't a case of I'll, I'll go on YouTube and find some golf fitness videos. It was sure. sort of looking around the gym thinking, right, what's everybody else doing? What, what are most people doing on a regular basis? And I'll have a go at copying that. And, you know, you get in there and you, you go on all the machines and you try them out and, you know, I, I think it was more of a case of dabbling in about in and out of things as opposed to knowing what I was doing. And um, when I was younger, I used to, used to get a lot of lower back pain. Um, consequently, from the way in which I was swinging the club, but also being the fact that I'm quite light and, you know, just in general sort of relatively slim. So there's not a lot to me. So I wasn't very strong as a kid. Um, so then trying to swing a golf club in a certain way took its toll over a period of time. So uh, at one point, I think it probably got to about, I was about 22 or 23 and, and got some help from a physio who kind of directed me in, in a certain direction with a few exercises. And I sort of learned a few things from that and, and, you know, information and things are changing as, you know, as I was getting older. So things were getting better and more accessible and, and easier. But certainly when, when I was playing as an amateur and a, a couple of years as a pro, the golf fitness was just not a thing. It sure. wasn't a word that was ever, ever said. Um, if people were going to the gym, they were going to the gym for the enjoyment of the gym or that kind of um, sort of, what's the word? Um, uh, I can't think of the word that I'm looking for, but sort of to work on their body from like a, a physical perspective as opposed to any kind of performance perspective. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, whereas now you say golf fitness and it's, it's pretty normal, you know, most, most clubs, most amateur players will have some form of, either gym training or something that they, they aim to direct towards their golf to improve. Um, but that's only really happened over the last sort of maybe three to five years. The last two years, it's certainly spiralled a lot with obviously the likes of Bryson and players like that that really mm -hmm. bring that on. Yeah, I mean, I heard you talk about that in your podcast um, because it is, it is something, in terms of the fitness side, it has really only come in in maybe, like you said, last five, ten years where now these golfers are being seen as athletes and they do have to start going mm. to the gym and, and what have you. People before just saw them as golfers, not athletes. So it's a really good point. And I think access as well is a good point. As you said, now everybody's got access to YouTube. And even if you don't have maybe the resource in terms of money, you can still get a lot of information online for free. Whereas yeah. again, maybe when you were playing, if you're not somebody that does have the resources of money, it's very difficult to get that information. You know, maybe you can't afford a coach or whatever it is for the, the physical side, the mental side. So it, I imagine it was, you know, really difficult. Um, so moving on to the business itself then. So how long ago did you start that business? Um, so it's been seven years, uh, just gone. Okay. And just give us a little bit, back, bit of background into that then in terms of what it is you do, what you do for your clients um, from start to finish. Yeah, so... Um... My, my business basically is, is a golf fitness business. So the aim is to help you become a fitter, stronger, more mobile, faster golfer in, in whatever concept you want that to be. And we were talking about accessibility there before. And I think one of my big values and my big goals as a coach is to make golf fitness accessible for every golfer. Because I think sometimes there's been a bit of a misconception with that phrase that people think when you say golf fitness, it's only relevant to the likes of Bryson and Rory. And I'm not that mm. person that's going to go spend two hours in the gym, sweating it out because I, I just don't like that. Well, for me, one of the things I've been really big on is to kind of almost re-educate people and sort of remove that phrase in the sense where it golf fitness is its roundabout term. That's the sort of umbrella we put it under, but actually it can be whatever you want it to be. 
So it can be simply two or three basic exercises you can do at home every day with no equipment, or it can be the other end of the scale where you might be an up and coming pro or you are a pro and it's a case of, right, I play 12 months a year and we have to schedule these workouts that include weights, um, club head speed training, all these other things, you know, and, and those two things both come under golf fitness, but we just have two different golfers who want a different experience from it. So for me, that's kind of uh, how I look on things in terms of my business, my job, basically how I describe it to a lot of people is I'm, I'm just a bit of a middleman. You know, you're the golfer. You probably have a golf coach. You want to play better golf or swing better. And I'm in the middle to help you get there as fast as you can. Um, so a, a quite a common thing that's, that's heard from a lot of players that come in is they'll say, my coach says I need more turn in my backswing or I need to get more into my right hip or whatever it is. And physically they can't do it. Or well, they can do it, but they can't repeat it consistently. And they certainly can't repeat it at speed. So therefore, we have to have a bit of an intervention to try and help them physically improve these factors from a biomechanical perspective. And then we look at helping them to become stronger so we can maintain those mo movements and then make them at speed. Um, and then obviously we have, hopefully, the general enjoyment of being in the gym and the crossover that has onto your actual health and daily life. Um, so I think one of the great things about targeting health and fitness towards your golf is the fact that the bounce back actually then transfers in day-to-day -day life. So for anybody that doesn't like going to the gym, all of a sudden, maybe someone like yourself, Alex, you said that actually the gym's not really your thing. You've never been into it, but you know that from a golf perspective, you'd like to improve. And this is one way that it can help you. That if I say to you, here's five exercises and you know, in a few weeks time, this is going to help you get on that track to being a better golfer all of a sudden doing those five exercises becomes you know less of a mental barrier and therefore doing it is improving your health anyway um so there are many kind of factors that go into it but for me my my, my biggest goal is to make it as accessible for every golfer regardless of whatever level you play at whatever equipment you have whether you're a gym member or you're not a gym member whatever current state of health that you're in there's always something that you can improve. Yeah, I mean, I just want to echo that point about the golf fitness because it definitely is the, the same case in my scenario, as you mentioned. Somebody that's never enjoyed the gym, somebody that's always been the one that signs up for, you know, three, six months, thinking he's going to stick with it or she's going to stick with it and then give it up on it eventually because it's just not my thing and I'm not interested in it. So when, you know, I heard about your business and especially when I knew it was local to me and it was all about the golf swing and as you said, improving those golf movements that you're going to need to, to, to be a better golfer, that was just enough for me. I was like, well, I can do it for that reason. And, you know, now I've only just started, but already in the gym, I'm much more motivated to do it because I know it is for that golf swing and, and to become a better golfer. And as you kind of touched on there as well, it's not only going to help my golfing ability, it's also then going to just help me out in general life because I'm going to become fitter anyway. Um, you know, it doesn't mean that I need to put on a load of muscle or anything like that. It's just going to make my body stronger and allow me to do, um, you know, certain things that I need to do. Um, so yeah, I definitely want to echo that point. And um, just for people that, you know, maybe want to know a little bit more information then, give us a little bit more information about the, the screening. Obviously I did that with you fairly recently. Um, what sort of things are you normally looking at in golfers to be able to determine what they need help with? Yeah, so the screening is typically the first sort of port of call with, with every golfer that we work with. Um, and it's basically a series of 16 movement tests. They're all relatively basic in terms of, like I said to you, there's nothing that will make you uncomfortable or out of breath. Um, and these tests are designed by TPI, which is the Titleist Performance Institute. And they've kind of come up with this testing system to be able to test um, any golfer in the world in exactly the same way and have some sort of comparison if that's what you want to use it for. Um, so all of these tests basically are biomechanical movements that will happen at some point within the golf swing, or we would like to see them happen. So the aim of this testing is to sort of uncover your physical strengths and weaknesses. And if you have any physical limitations holding back your golf swing. So like we said earlier, if coach is asking you to get in certain positions and physically you feel like a, you can't, or B, it's too much hard work to even get there, then there's a potential for a, a limitation to be in play and stopping you getting there. So at my end, it gives me some clarity in terms of what I need to work on with you. So like yours, Alex, we saw a couple of things in there that were creating a few patterns around the hips and things like that. So we know that 
hip rotation and stability of the pelvis might be an issue for you in the golf swing. So therefore, if you go and have a golf lesson, we can pass that information to the golf coach and all of a sudden make their job a lot easier. And like I said, I'm kind of that middleman that's going, right, this is what I've seen. This is what we might potentially see Alex do in his golf swing. So when you're working on X, Y, Z, these are a couple of things to consider for the time being, and that mm -hmm. might sort of help you out. Off the back of that testing system, it gives you a bit of understanding of how your body moves. So traditionally in golf, particularly, we've always been a very technique dominant sport. You listen to people talk about the golf swing from years gone by, and there's barely any mention of your body and, and the joints and, and how biomechanically we move as people. So everything's very technique heavy. So I think it allows you as the golfer to understand why you move the way you do, basically. Um, and I think with this as well, it's, it's important to point out that everyone's so individual that everybody's movements and golf swings will be completely unique and there's really not a right or wrong. We typically have like a textbook golf swing that we look to try and copy someone like Adam Scott or Tiger in his prime, maybe sure. modern day like Louis Eustazen who's almost like pristine perfect. Mm -hmm. But even if you look across the tour from there, every swing is, is so individualistic. You won't really see anyone completely textbook. And that's because everyone is built differently. Everyone's limbs are different lengths, joints are different depths and, and sizes. So therefore the movements that are created are going to be different from person to person. So the aim of that screening really is to, to see what we're starting with, to go, right, okay, you walk in that gym, Alex, right? What are we dealing with? Where do we need to take you? So we're not guessing about from my end. I go, like I said to you in that session in the gym, if I just say to you, go and do 20 squats, well, what's, what's the point in that? What's the mm -hmm. purpose of that? Like, where is that taking you? Yes, that might get you tired and that will get you stronger to a certain degree, but then we're going to hit a bit of a ceiling and where do we go after that? So it's about knowing what you're doing and why you're doing it and how that takes you closer to the goals you're trying to achieve as a golfer. Um, and I think that screening really does give a, a nice understanding uh, for the golfer and for me. And my job is to make it as simple or as complicated as you want it to be, you know, because mm -hmm. some golfers will come in and they want to know millimeters of movement. They want me to measure their range of movement in some cases, whereas some golfers come in and go, I'm not really bothered what this says. I just want you to tell me what it means and what I need to do. Mm -hmm. So I, I'll sort of filter out what, what is necessary and what's not. Um, but it's, it's a really great tool to start with. So we know, where we're taking that player going forwards. Yeah, and I was going to say that, I mean, you know, I imagine some people that are exactly like what you said, where they just want to know what is it I need to do in the gym and nothing else. But I really yeah. love the, the, the final part in particular because I'm very analytical about my own game, the swing, etc. So when we went through all the different tests at the end of what had passed, what had failed, and then how you went through every single uh, individual one and explain how that's relevant to the goal swing and how it's, you know, maybe holding me back or how I'm, how, um, you know, maybe I'm going to be able to do something that I couldn't do before because it's going to improve, et cetera. I think that was the best part for me is learning about how it's relatable to the swing. Um, so for, you know, maybe again, amateur golfers who don't care too much about the in-depth information about it, how do you kind of break that information down to its simplest form for those people? If they weren't like me where they do like the analytical parts, how would you do that? Mm -hmm. So my, my main question would be sort of, um, are you having golf lessons? If so, what are you working on? What are you struggling with? Um, and what do you want to achieve? Why are you here? You know, there's a, there's a reason why you're here in the first place. Um, and it must be because you feel that something physical, whatever box it's in, is either not good enough at this point in time or preventing you from, from being better in one way or another. So there has to be a reason why the client's in there in the first place. So if I can find out a bit more information about them in terms of what they're looking for from, from their golf, then I can kind of filter out what I need at, at that relevant level. Um, I think in simple terms, sometimes it's better to kind of look at the, the bigger movements and explain. So for example, things like rib cage rotation and hip rotation. So they're often things that we hear a lot regurgitated within lessons. Um, you don't often hear so much talk about wrist flexion and extension, which for you, as you'll know, were these, these kind of tests. Mm -hmm. um, obviously that's huge in the golf swing, but it's it's about me kind of taking the, the sciencey words out of it and all the things that, that I resonate to because that's, that's how my brain works and that's what I talk on a daily basis, filtering that out and saying, look, if you move this better, then we get the club here. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're looking for. And, and how we're going to move this better is by trialing this exercise here on the floor. Let's have a practice of this. 
And when I see you next week, has this made a difference? If it hasn't, it's potentially the wrong intervention and we need to go down a different route. And, and that's for me to reanalyze and choose a different exercise or find a different way of doing it. And, and there's various different ways that that can happen. Um, and if it does work, then perfect. We're on, we're on our, uh, our way on the right path. Um, so I think it's more a case of asking the client, what do you want? You know, when, I, when I start with people, I will often ask them, you know, how do you learn best? Some mm -hmm. people like to be shown. Some people like to be described to. Um, some people like homework in a sense where it's like you, they can keep going over things and almost like retain that information in the memory. Um, and sometimes it's total trial and error and people don't know. I, I mm -hmm. still sort of think sometimes like, I'm not sure what's my best learning route occasionally. Um, I think it's very much client led. It's, you know, you tell me what you need and I'll, I'll do my best to get you there. Yeah. I mean, can you make any links between maybe like issues that somebody's having with their body and a certain issue they're having with their swing or their shot. So let's say, for example, we've got five golfers and they all seem to have this horrible slice that keeps happening and they can't seem to help it. Is there like common links between those kind of mistakes in the, in the golf shots that then are normally something that relates to the body? So, you know, maybe it's because they can't quite get their body rotated around quick enough and therefore they leave the face open and the body open. Can you make those yeah. kind of links or... No. Yeah, absolutely. Like we, we see common traits a lot. Um, I don't think, I don't think there's absolutes. I don't, I personally, as a coach, don't believe in absolutes. I think your body is too interchanging to ever say that this 100% causes that, but there's definitely traits and common patterns that you see. And with the golf swing being so biomechanically technical, if you think of it as a chain reaction, almost from like toe to head, if one piece of that puzzle is not playing its role 100%, then another piece has to take over and therefore that changes the motion slightly. So just to take the slice as an example, uh, one of the, the big common traits we see with people who slice it is that they come over the top. So they've got that sort of out to in club path where the face is like you said, just coming open, they're cutting across it and we see that big slice um, ball flight. And one of the big causes of that is a lack of separation or what we call like dissociation. So the inability to move individual segments of your body without another part moving. So if you imagine um, someone chopping wood, you often see them with, a, with an axe and they're like yeah. straight over the top because that's the most powerful way to chop a piece of wood. And that almost mimics that kind of slice position or over the top position we see in the golf swing. And often that is because the upper body and the lower body don't separate very well. So the body moves as one, therefore taking the arms with you and coming over the top into that position mm -hmm. whereas in a in an ideal world from a biomechanical perspective and a technical perspective what we'd like to see you do is once you've completed a backswing we'd like to see that left hip pull away from you first to start that transition into the downswing and that subtle movement is dissociation and it's it's very very subtle we're talking millimeters worth of movement mm -hmm. but in order to do that successfully and then take the upper body next in that sequence in with the arms third and the club last or that leg position and the face hitting the ball last that also requires a lot of separation so separation then is basically the ability to move the rib cage and the pelvis independently so if you imagine that's pelvis that's rib cage one moves mm -hmm. while the other's still and then that moves separately as well which was two of the tests that we actually put you through yeah so that's one common trait you see a lot and and the physical um, faults for that you never typically know where it starts 100 it's very chicken and egg you know there's a correlation between the two it's very difficult to say this started first and that's why it's doing that and and I, I like I said I don't like to work in absolutes I think there's too much interchange in things day to day and week by week but if we can look at that pattern and break it down and go right okay I think I think if we can get this spine moving better and this rib cage a little bit more mobile and create some side bend things that are required for rotation teach you the skill of having to dissociate then we start to be able to then put that into the motion of the golf swing so yeah. that kind of physical skill becomes a technical skill if that makes sense mm -hmm. and with all that being said then like what sort of signals could an amateur golfer again speaking from my own experience for example I've always felt like because of my age I've always been in decent shape even though I don't go to the gym um you know, I don't have like many injuries that are causing me issues day to day. So I've always felt like I didn't really need to do the goal side, uh, fitness side of it. So 
what sort of things would you say an amateur could notice in their game if maybe they're they're not having any of those issues, but again, maybe they're not reaching the handicap they want to be at. What sort of things could they be feeling in their body or in their swing that where they might just go, oh, maybe I do actually need to go and see somebody like yourself and have this uh, have these sorts of screenings and, and maybe start to do uh, some sessions. Yeah, I think I think the, the biggest thing that sort of calls people into action is some form of pain or ache. I think um, I can't remember the exact stat, but there's something ridiculous on lower back pain where it's like, I think. 35% of golfers have lower back pain across the world at one point in time. So it's like if you've got a four ball of players, one in one in four will be playing with some form of back pain or has had some form of back pain. As, so, as a result of golf or just in general? Um, who knows? Who it knows? could be mm. as a result of golf, but we don't actually know 100%. You know, they could have injured themselves 10 years ago or whatever it might be. But at that point in time, they're playing their round of golf with some form of pain. Sure. Um, so that that typically is the first thing is that people want to get out of pain and, and they want to sort of take that away. Um, a lot of other common stuff is sort of a lack of stability. So they feel like they're not grounded, almost like there's no strength into the floor. Um, typically, you find people who strength train or come into the gym on a regular basis, have an awareness of the ground. And that sounds ridiculous, but a lot of exercises that you will do in the gym, so lunging, squatting, hinging, or require a concept of awareness of your foot on the ground and how that brings that pressure up into the chain. So if you think about a golf setup, it's essentially like a quarter squat or a hinge position. And we're looking for people to be relatively athletic in their setup, because if we get set up right as a player, then what follows has a better chance of being successful. So an awareness to the ground or a stability to the ground is often something that's reported back. Um, and just a general, um, increase in range of motion or what people actually describe as like freeness or kind of this oily motion where all of a sudden they started moving in ways they've never moved before that they feel better they feel like they can complete a backswing for the first time ever versus you know being three quarters or even half a backswing in some people's cases but mm -hmm. actually I think a lot of it is mental confidence in that if you know you've put some work in you know that things will be changing you know it's, it's relatively impossible to to go and train at the gym and not improve unless you're doing something drastically wrong. You know, there'll, there'll be an improvement in there somewhere along the line. Might only be half a percent compared to someone else's 3%, but there will be progress. So yeah, I think that carries a lot of weight in golf because obviously, you know, golf is hard, isn't it? So it's, a, it's as much a mental game as it is a, a physical one and a, a technical one. So if you've got your brain on your side, that's it's a massive one up that I think before you start. For sure. I mean, I imagine some of the, the things that people might struggle with are, are so minute that they can't even notice it as well. Because I think looking back at my golf swing now, I slightly sway to the to the right as I do my backswing. And before I was probably thinking that was technique. But when I look back at it now, that's probably, again, due to the, the strength that I had in my body, that it's not able to completely pull the club back, get it in the air and hold that kind of, you know, because it is a tough movement, isn't it? Um, yeah. And therefore, I was kind of compensating with my body by leaning towards kind of my right-hand side. So I imagine there's little things like that as well that aren't so noticeable. Yeah, I mean, it's very subtle. You know, if you think um, the golf swing's got many moving parts to it, but it's happening at pace. So it's very hard to feel within the body. It's very hard to, to sense actual bone moving and joints moving. Um, and even in the gym, in certain exercises, it's, it's very difficult to feel certain ranges of motion. And that's why, you know, we'll give you sort of cues and technique pointers to to think about the motion from different places so like your uh, hip hip cars exercise for example Alex like we're asking you to move the hip independently but the motion is driven by the knee because any kind of sensation within the hip joint is very difficult to feel on a deep level mm -hmm. so for you to think about it coming from there makes no sense because you, you can't really grasp onto anything and relate to it whereas if I ask you to imagine you're drawing a circle with your knee all of a sudden that motion becomes easier to think about and actually the hip will have to move as a result of that so I think that's probably um one reason um is that we're, we're swinging at speed you know if you've got driver people are trying to crush it you know people want to hit the ball as hard as they can because that's fun and it's enjoyable and and that's just kind of how the game has gone really in modern times sure. um if I ask you to try and stop at full pace just before you hit the ball it's, it's impossible you know it's virtually you'd be like 
tiger with a photographer yeah. behind him it's you know <laughs> it's so difficult um and that's probably one reason that the, the golf club is swung at pace um and again secondly because the, the movements are so intricate you know we're asked the actual biomechanics of the golf swing are, are really really intricate in terms of what's moving where um and, and there's so much of it. You know, if you thought about every segment of your body that was moving when you hit a shot, you'd never play golf again. It'd be, you just wouldn't sure. want to go there. It's, uh, it's too much information. So we, we try and break it down in, in simple terms from a gym perspective. And, and hopefully that's what a, a good golf coach will be doing as well, is breaking down those movements and, and having um, an easier path to learn. And um, I think as well, sort of linking it back to the physical, because golf swing spoken about only in a technical aspect can only get you so far. You know, that's just my personal opinion because I'm a strength and conditioning coach. So I'm obviously going to be so far on the fence with the physical stuff, but I think linking it back to a, a physical feeling within the body actually engages the brain a bit more from a learning perspective. And mm -hmm. therefore you're more likely to retain the information. You're more likely to grab onto a sensation and a feeling that you can then go and repeat. So as pure example, I, I played golf yesterday with, a friend and, and one of his friends and hit it horrendous for the front nine like I couldn't even get the ball 10 foot in the air and every tee box I'm thinking like there's nothing for me to grab onto here like I can't pick a sensation out of anything and then weirdly enough all of a sudden the sun came out and just as I was set over the ball and the sun was out and the light was different the ball just looked different on the tee the club looked different behind the ball and all of a sudden my takeaway looked different and I picked up onto something and hit the ball pretty good for the back nine. So it's just, you'll, you'll know as a golfer that those kind of like subtle, almost stupid little things that happen that you can grab onto. So if you're linking your practice and, and your training always to a physical feeling, I think it's, it definitely helps that, that learning process over time. Yeah, and I think that's where... I bit of the mental side comes into it as well. Um, I mean, I'm reading quite a few different books regarding the mental side of golf at the moment, just because I find it as fascinating now as the, as the physical stuff. And it's a, kind of a good example of what you mentioned there, whereby, you know, you're trying to find something mid-round of what you're doing in your swing. And yeah. I mean, some of the experts like say that maybe that's kind of the worst thing you can do, right? You're trying to change the mechanics of your swing or yeah. feel like you, there's something that you're not doing and therefore experiment mid round when really you've just got to, got to trust your swing in that case, haven't you? <laughs> yeah. And it's really hard to do. Um, I think if you, particularly if you've been working on technical aspects, you're always caught in two minds. You're like, should I forget that and just go and play? But then the back of your mind knows that just go and play is like an old swing and not the new one that you're working on. But I think there's, there's a lot of information out there to suggest that, your brain often doesn't remember more than three um, different types of information or, or three pieces mm -hmm. of information. So if you're stood over the ball going, right, press your feet into the floor, take, take the takeaway back slowly, wind up, mm -hmm. then, then get that left hip going. So it's too much to overload. Mm -hmm. And you're trying to do that at pace and actually hit, you know, focus on a target and hit a decent shot as well. It's, that's making it hard work. Um, yeah, I think it's a hundred percent true. I've noticed it with my with my own game. As soon as I start thinking about it, it it goes wrong. It, yeah. I mean, it, it's difficult to find a balance, right? Because I always say, yeah. you know, you obviously should have a pre shot routine. You should always maybe have that one feel. For me, it's shallow in the club. That one feel, like right. So I want to feel it coming here. But then at the same time, you don't want to be thinking about all that. You really should just step up to the tee and hit it. But then it's like having that balance because I don't want to just go up and hit it without having a pre shot yeah. routine. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. And I think you hear like you hear a lot of tour players say they often will have one swing thought, whatever mm -hmm. that is, what you know, whether that's uh, something that's set up or, or some kind of set within the takeaway. I think it often happens within that first quarter of a swing because they're the bits you can feel and you can see more. Mm -hmm. For me, like my, my swing thought is often to have a long takeaway because I can be I can whip it inside very quickly and sort of lose all my width and get a little bit flat and a bit trapped. So for me, if I can take my takeaway back almost as long and as, and as uh, exaggerated as I can, I get a bit more width and I get more turn and I get into my right hip a bit better and, and all of a sudden I've created a bit of rhythm. So that's typically the thing that I will think of, but it doesn't work all the time. You know, that's what I was thinking about the front nine yesterday and getting nowhere. So then mm. sometimes you just have those days where, and then this is kind of what I was saying about working in absolutes. You know, your body's just off. You might have gone to bed and slept in an unnatural position to what you normally would sleep in. Your head might have slid down the pillow and you got a bit of sure. neck pain and, and your head might be leaning to one side one day, which changes 
you know, how the sort of tension runs through the spine and how much rotation is created and, and how the fascia is sort of pulled and pushed in, in which direction within the body and all of a sudden everything feels different. Mm -hmm. So it, it doesn't take a lot for things to be not completely spot on. For sure. And just one more thing I wanted to touch on as well, and I think it's important to touch on it, but correct me if I am wrong with this, but... I imagine in terms of the results that people would get from, say, again, a service like your own, it isn't just driving distance or distance in general, is it? Because, again, as an example from my own um, kind of experience with, with, say, just something simple like chipping or putting, where you have that more kind of lent over the ball kind of feel, that's when I get a lot of back or lower back pain if I'm doing it for a long, long time. So I imagine as well the benefits and results that people can get from having uh, doing the service like what you offer, it isn't just a case of getting 10 or 20 yards extra on driving or irons, et cetera. Yeah, hundred percent. I think, um, and, and again, it comes down to, you know, what does a client want? I think distance is obviously a huge one because regardless of what level of golf you play, if you hit the ball further, it's an advantage, you know, whether you're a pro or, you know, you're a club golfer or you're a young junior, whatever it is. Um, and again, then we have those those other goals that people are looking at. One is to longevity of the game. So being able to play long into their like 60s and 70s and 80s, because that's the beauty of golf, isn't it? It's, it's a game that we can play hopefully forever with people of varying abilities um, on any golf course in the world and, and all play against each other and be ranked in the same way. Um, sure. So injury prevention and longevity of, of playing the game is huge, you know, and, and as we get older, things processes in our body start to decrease so we start to lose muscle tissue if we're not training and we start to lose mobility or range of motion if we're not using our body in various different ways day to day so then if we then try and play golf and we're on this decline all the time well of course your golf is going to get slightly worse you know when you look at senior players within most clubs you know if they're hitting it 20 yards shorter than they did five years ago well if they're seniors that aren't training, of course that's going to happen because that's mm -hmm. just the natural aging process. You know, we, we can't do anything about that unless we're going to grasp it and go, right, okay, I'm, I'm going to get training, I'm going to get stronger, I'm going to get more stable, and therefore that will benefit my golf. Um, so distance isn't just the, the main thing. You know, technique change is obviously huge. So yep. being able to move in a different way allows you be, to then be able to move in a different way within the golf swing. Um and some people like yourself that are just starting that are going, you know what, like health is important to me. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to find it difficult to do it on my own. So if I can target this to a, an outcome that I enjoy, i.e. I can see some improvements in my golf swing off the back of me spending a bit of time in the gym. And it's not that case of I've got to go on the gym and slog it off on a cross trainer for 45 minutes and, and not enjoy it. Then, then that's what it's about. And if you can break that process down into something little and often, that's where the, the best success comes in for me. Um, yeah. You know, I, I'll talk to all my clients like I have done with you, Alex, about little bits of homework that you can do on a daily basis. You know, simple drills that you can put the kettle on. By the time the kettle's boiled, you can have had one exercise completely boxed off. Mm -hmm. And if you can do that two or three times across the day, um, you know, you, you're moving all the time versus going, oh, it's 5.30 and I've got to try and get to the gym and it'll be 6.30 by the time sure. I get there and then I'm an hour in there and it's like eight by the time I'm home. It's, the thought of it even puts me off. So yeah. making it you know, accessible for your lifestyle and work for your lifestyle is the most important thing, I think, whenever you're trying to change anything. 100%. Well, Natalie, it's been great talking to you. Thank you for all the, the great insights and all the information. So for anybody that wants to find you, it's uh, ProFit Golf Conditioning is the business. And the website is Pro, is it uh, Pro hyphen, is it? Fit, go, fit yeah, ProFitGolfConditioning.com. Yeah. So it's for anybody that wants you, you offer um, services there in the gym, they can also get them online. Um, yeah. Your podcast is ProFit Golf Conditioning Podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts. Uh, and then people yeah. can also check out your content uh, on Instagram. And also you've got some YouTube fitness videos on Alex Elliott Golf as well. Yeah. So there's a whole host of things you can you can get stuck into on there. Well, like I said, I mean, I definitely recommend it from a, from a client myself. It's been great um, getting to know you, your business, and looking forward to continuing our, our work. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Uh, thanks for your time, Alex. Thanks for the invite. Perfect. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks very much.